I'm sure it'll, yep, there we go. Um, so hello, welcome everyone. This is um, our book club chat on <clears throat> democracy in one book or less. Um, we're hosting this on behalf of All on the Line, which is an organization on a mission to end gerrymandering because it contributes to polarization and dysfunction in our political system. Y'all have heard me say that before, but again, we're here to make sure that the general public is able to access their representatives and fight for fair maps in the 2021, or depending on if you live in Florida, 2022 redistricting process. So um, I wanna thank you all for joining. Uh, just a little bit about me, my name's Shahen. I'm actually a deputy, uh, actually I'm a former <laughs> deputy campaign director with All on the Line. Um, I'm now a senior political strategist with the organization. I switched roles, which um, I'm going to get into a little bit later about why this is our last book club, spoiler alert. Um, <clears throat> but I also really wanted to thank David Litt, who is our author who is joining us today. Um, many of you may have read Thanks Obama, his last book, um, but uh, you probably have also heard his work come through in things that President Obama said um, between 2012, sorry, David, 2012 and 2015, 2016, um, when he was a speechwriter with the White House. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Marina Jenkins, who is the Director of Litigation and Policy with All in the Line um, <clears throat> in the National Redistricting Foundation. Um, so thank you both for joining us. I'm really excited to have you here. Thanks for having us. Uh, great, well, we're excited. Um, so just a little bit uh, in the way of introduction, uh, as I mentioned, this is our last book club in the series. Um, that's not because of like my job switch over, but it's actually because we are pivoting to the election. Um, we are 62 days out from election day, uh, which is one way of thinking about it. I also use a bigger like number that like triggers panic in my head, which is nine weeks out from election day. Um, I don't know whichever works for people, nine weeks, 62 days. Um, but following the election, we're gonna actually start pivoting directly into the process for fighting for fair maps. Um, and in doing so that we hope that you are like participants and our volunteers will actually join us um, in marching and advocating at the Capitol or um, in your public hearings for commissions to say that you want fair maps in your community. So a little bit about today, we're gonna chat for the next hour or so. We're gonna talk a little bit about democracy in the big picture, but specifically about redistricting, obviously, what Marina and I think about way too often. Um, and then we'll pivot and we'll talk about the election. So David, does that sound good to you, Marina? Are we good? Yeah. yeah awesome. Okay, so David, my first question is for you. So you went from writing Thanks Obama and like talking about your years in the White House and then this book. So I just want to ask you, why democracy? Like, what was it that spurred you to say, like, this is what I want to write about next? So the, uh, first of all, let me just say, um, thanks for having us. And I'm sorry that apparently we killed book club. Um, I feel bad <laughs> no. about that. Uh, the, um, and, and, and particularly thank you to everyone. I feel like at this point, everyone is so zoomed out that if you're here at, uh, you know, 8 p.m. on, I think it's a Wednesday, I'm not sure anymore. Um, that means a lot. So thanks for being with us. And the other, th and I always say this in, uh, with all of the Zoom things that I do, I have found that the one thing about Zoom that is most different is that people never want to ask questions. I assume we're doing audience questions at some point. Are we doing audience questions? Maybe if we can get to it. Yeah. If not, okay. we'll, we'll figure out how to uh, get to it. All right. If we end up doing audience questions, uh, I've just tried to shame everybody starting from the very beginning into asking questions. They don't have to be about a book or about redistricting. You just heard us talk about nonsense for like 15 minutes before this started. So ask us whatever. Um, but this book. So I wrote Thanks Obama right after I left the White House. And it was, you know, that was for me about just processing the experience that I had, talking about all the times I embarrassed myself in front of the president and thinking about what it meant to be in public service as a young, not terribly important person in the White House. I ended up writing Democracy in One Book or Less for a, a totally different reason to me, it's kind of like my um, young adult book rather than my like slightly grown up child book. And the reason I say that is because when I was in the White House and then especially during the Trump era, we keep seeing the same thing happen over and over and over again, which is the American people want one set of things from their government, whether it's on gun violence or climate change or how we respond to COVID. And then our government, our democratically elected representative government keeps doing not just not what we want, but the opposite of what we want. 
And I started to try to realize, or I, or I had this realization that despite all of the time that I spent in government and despite knowing all the words to Schoolhouse Rock, I have no idea how our system of government really works and why it doesn't seem to be working. And so I spent about two and a half years trying to figure it out and trying to talk about all of it. So connecting the dots between voting and judges and gerrymandering and campaign finance and getting into all of it and then writing about it in a way that I would read. Because if a book is too thick or too dense, um, if it would hurt too much if I dropped it on my foot, I tend not to finish it. And so this was a book about our democracy, our political process, but for people who don't want to read something that is not enjoyable. And hopefully, um, you know, that's, that's the reaction that you will have if you read it. But um, to me, that was the, it was trying to solve that basic question. And, uh, you know, the short version is, and, and to think about how we solve it, the way I describe it sometimes is it's kind of my guide for uh, shattering Mitch McConnell's dreams within Mitch McConnell's lifetime. That's the goal. Honestly, like, you made me laugh, which is hard to say about, um, I read a lot of books about, like, democracy and, like, the fighting voter suppression or redlining. And this is the first time I actually read it and I was like giggling to myself, which was kind of embarrassing when um, you're like, I, like this is so serious of a topic, but like, I don't know, everyone goes to work and they talk about democracy. Like the, well, Marina and I go to work and we talk about democracy all day, but like we giggle about things because like you have to bring some lightheartedness into it. Um, so yes, I agree. Like this is a book that you're like, oh, this isn't, like, this is accessible. This is something we can talk about. So, um, I mean, I, I like, I don't know, redistricting litigation is really <laughs> nuanced and niche. And like, I don't know, I'm really curious. I mean, I, I work with you every day. And so I like kind of know the answer, but like, why this work? Why is this what you do? Sure. Um, so I I've always been drawn to redistricting because it really is, foundational to everything else. And so similar to what David was describing, you know, I think once I started to sort of hone in on, okay, um, I studied, I, I'm a student of history, I studied history and African American studies in college and, you know, got really interested in specifically 20th century African American history. And so, you know, really focused in on um, the civil rights movement and you know the, the struggle for black power throughout the 20th century and so that was sort of um academically my focus and so you know voting rights it was just always so such a big part of, of that story and um and so you know i think when you when you start digging into our systems and trying to understand and and, and i totally have to agree with you shahan in terms of um the book you know, being able to also, David, like bring in so much history and do it with humor and give us the perspective of the, like what we're dealing with right now is like really hard and can be very scary, but it's also like, it, it, I feel like you, you, you haven't, there's an ease with which you've sort of placed us in, you place us in a good perspective of like, our country has dealt with, you know, bigger problems. And, and so, it, you know, I, I laughed every time you would make a comment in the book about like how, you know, um, uh, advocates or lawyer, like the, just the, the words that we use and the phrases that are given to, to things and bills and, and whatnot. Um, because some of it, so much of it can seem heavy and nuanced. But I mean, for me, redistricting specifically is just like, it is the thing that is you know, if you don't get it right, and on so many of the topics that are each chapter of the book, like, it's, it, it, it's like a domino effect, right? And so like, if we are not electing people who are going to be responsive to the will of the voter, then it doesn't matter if everybody wants climate reform. It doesn't matter if um, everybody wants, you know, gun safety measures, because the politicians are not listening to the people and they don't have to. Um, and so it's sort of like once I sort of sort of started understanding those systems and how they work, um, you know, redistricting just seems like such a fundamental uh, building block of, of what we have to build off of. And so if we can't get that right, then you, you know, you're sort of um, handicapped for, for everything else. No, that, that, that is the fun. I think that's why so many like, so many members of like our community are drawn to this work is because when you talk about the issue that like wakes you up and gets you fired up every day and you're like that's what I want to go fight for and then you're like why why is nothing changing why is nothing changing and then you're like let me go back and figure this out I think that's 
like something so different and appealing for about the fight for redistricting and like the fight for fair maps. Um, I mean, like everyone, I, I, I said this in trainings before, like what's the news alert that you get on your phone that's like the finally that moment that triggers you to wake up and say like, I'm so sick of this, I want to go fight for something. Um, and everyone like has a moment that's a little bit different. Like some people are like, you know, it was the Iraq war when they were like 16 years old and they were like, this isn't working for me. And like, I think that's like, oh, that was me. Uh, <laughs> it was like, you know, this isn't working like the way that our democracy is functioning when like, isn't working. And then that, that brings you into the fold. Um, everyone feels a little bit different. And so like, I think if I just like actually dig in, I want to talk a little bit about the redistricting chapter, David, because um, you talk about political geography as different from gerrymandering. Um, and it was really interesting for me to think about this, especially that um, what is the difference between that? Like you're, when you say like, why can't I access my member who live, who, of Congress um, who, who votes differently than I do? And then you realize I'm like, what is, can we just talk about bubbles a little bit for me. Yeah, um, and I should quickly say, so, uh, you know, to try to embrace the Zoom era, I bought one of these, like, uh, fancy light thingies, which has now fallen, so it looks like I'm one of the, like, you know, a kid on Halloween or something. We're just going to go with it. Um, we're yeah. talking about spooky stuff here, so. Uh, Sounds great. We're, we're going to embrace it. Um, the, the thing that I think is really important to recognize about gerrymandering, and it's kind of ironic because it's, like, the thing that people actually know about. There's so many parts of our political process that have broken down that people don't know about. And two of them in particular, voter ID and gerrymandering, I think have captured the popular imagination among progressives. And often, frankly, we overstate just the, the impact of those things on our um, elections and on the nature of our democracy. Um, it doesn't mean they're not bad, but it means that uh, they're more nuanced than we might at first think. So, the way I think about gerrymandering is basically you have um, demographic changes and trends, which are like a kind of forest fire sweeping through our democracy. And then gerrymandering is like if someone went around and committed a whole bunch of acts of arson in the immediate aftermath of that forest fire. So again, this is not from personal experience. I should make that very clear. But the, what you end up seeing is uh, people exacerbating trends that are already existing Rather than, rather than doing something that's completely unrelated to the trends that exist. What I mean by that is the, one of the biggest changes that has happened in American life is that Democrats are now the parties of cities and they tend to be very densely packed together and Republicans tend to be the parties of rural areas. But what's interesting about it is democratic bubbles, so everyone's in a bubble these days, right? Like it's a very fancy liberal thing to be like, oh my gosh, you know, Democrats were in such a bubble because you know, nothing makes you a Democrat like complaining about being a Democrat. But in truth, everyone's in a bubble. The difference is two things. Democratic bubbles are literally denser, that you live nearer to your neighbors on a, in most cases than in Republican bubbles. And also they're slightly more blue than Republican bubbles are red. So um, among, let's say, just the counties that were 80% of the people voted for one candidate or, or the other, Hillary Clinton won her margin of victory in just those 80, 20 counties was 2.5 million votes. And that includes basically all of your big cities and then a lot of like smaller cities that, you know, um, right, I'm from New York originally, we would not have called the city, but in American context, they're cities. And what happens because of that is a good example is just you take where I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. If you tried to draw a perfectly competitive district, you couldn't do it. You cannot take 86th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam and draw a district around it that encompasses 730,000 people that's competitive in any meaningful way because it's all Democrats and you'd have to get, I think it's like to Secaucus, New Jersey before you reach even like one precinct that voted for Trump. And so we see that happening all over. So, so what you, that, that's kind of the forest fire part. Now, because of that, it also makes partisan gerrymandering much easier because if you're looking at a map and you're trying to make it as unfair as possible, it's very easy to take the party that's packed into cities and isolate them in super uncompetitive districts and then carve up the rest of the territory where, you're, where you have a slight advantage. Um, but I think it's really, it, it's pretty crucial to understand those changes in part because even if we succeed, 
and undo a lot of the worst abuses in terms of gerrymandering, we're likely still on a trajectory, unless things change pretty substantially, where Democrats could still be um, you know, kind of behind the eight ball when it comes to control of Congress. And we need to know why that is. Nope, I was having trouble unmuting there. No, I mean, like, it, it's really interesting. And uh, like, as we talk about cities and like geography and like, where are people moving to? I mean, people are moving out of the cities and into the suburbs, right? For example, now with um, COVID, like, I don't know, whoever's on Twitter keeps seeing this like retweeted thing about like, all these New Yorkers lined up on the last weekend of the month to like get their U-Hauls. Well, also like the end of the month, that's when everyone moves. This is like not, <laughs> not rocket science, but then- also be moving within New York. I just want to, as a New Yorker- yeah, no, exactly. To point <laughs> no, that's like, that's exactly true. And then like, you know, you also hear like the New York Times reporting on like, oh my God, like this one house in New Jersey got 90 offers on it because people are all trying to move. But like the one question that comes to mind that like, it's like floating in the back of my head about how what is the impact on COVID like we talk about like what's the impact of COVID on like the election what's the impact of COVID on the census which we'll get into a little bit but like what's the impact of COVID on people moving so quickly and like how is that going to shape this country a little bit differently because in my head you know cities like you said are Democrats they're blue bubbles and as Democrats and like just move out of cities and into the suburbs or into rural parts of the country, what is the shift gonna actually look like? And are we gonna move away from, as you call them, communities of sameness? I don't know. Yeah. No, it's a good point. I mean, uh, listen, my, my brother, the one who's getting married this weekend that we were talking about earlier, also just moved, he and his, my future sister-in-law, just moved from the like this like cute, apartment in Brooklyn that was obviously like in a super awesome location and allowed them to do lots of fun city stuff and just like two weeks ago moved back to New Jersey. Um, so, you know, it's, it, that's real. And it's an interest. I mean, I, I, it's another perspective that I loved about the book is like the, this idea that like we, you know, we, it's very easy, especially when you're in this work or when you're, you know, when you're doing the work and you're very, um, invested in it and very committed and it can feel all consuming it can feel like you know things have never been this difficult or things you know every, every nothing's going to change and again like this sense of like you know who these systems are benefiting over time or like that that you know a year ago we would have been having the same conversation and before covid we would have said oh well this political geography is such a big problem but now we are in this scenario where those trends are changing. And I, I do think that we're going to see some shifting. You know, it's obviously very interesting. We're in a census year. So, you know, not only do we have, you know, people who are moving around um, and how that could, how that could shift the political geography, but how that actually then impacts redistricting as well, um, you know, will be a very interesting thing to see if, if there is more of that uh, you know, urban flight to, to the suburbs and how that, how, you know, I feel like the suburban towns are already such a focus um, of a lot of campaigns. And so sort of seeing how that could e e be even more sort of accelerated or amplified by, you know, the, it feels wrong to call it phenomenon, but um, the reality that, that COVID is, um, you know, causing a lot of people to, seek a little bit more space uh, and, and, and sort of, you know, second guess the, the um, decision to live in a city where you, you know, pay more for, for less space. And it's just the reality. Um, just, can I just add one, one thing? About yeah. That? So it actually, in an interesting way, the parallel, I think, is with 1918 and 1920, because in 1918, or 1920, exactly 100 years ago, was the first time a majority of Americans lived in cities and a lot of rural politicians blamed it on the First World War and said, well, this is a temporary phenomenon. Um, and so they actually didn't redistrict uh, in, after the 1920 census, even though it was totally unconstitutional to do that. Um, and their argument was, well, this was, you know, we can't actually count it. People just move to cities because of the war and then they'll all move home. And one of the, um, the interesting, like when we just think about American politics and when you think about these structural issues, there's no perfect way to design a country. And so you end up with these really weird things. So just to throw out a couple of possibilities, 
Um, one is, it's not just the, um, the, the public health uh, issues with COVID and potentially people moving um, from cities to suburbs, although and we'll have to see if that sticks or how, you know, it's always hard to tell, like, is this the New York Times, like, getting a lot of clicks or is this a real trend? Um, right. And I just don't know. Uh, but then the other thing is, if the suburbs continue to stay blue after Trump leaves office, um, hopefully soon, uh, that could also make a huge impact on redistricting because that would change the sort of underlying um, demographics of where Democrats live versus where Republicans live. And the, the other, and then just to get really, um, you know, really ex all sorts of fun ways our democracy could get kind of messed up. Imagine if say, Maria, your brother and your soon to be sister-in-law move to Jersey, uh, decide two years from now that actually they miss things like congregating in large spaces, move back to the city, and you could have an entire set of districts drawn based on population counts that predate that trend. And then we're going to have 10 years of districts that reflect a country that we no longer live in. So it's just um, the, the point of all this is not to say I have any idea what's going to happen, but to say that American politics and American history are shaped by these like profoundly weird kind of rules issues. Um, right. and, and we often overlook that. We just think, you know, history is about, and I say this as a speechwriter, history is about like important people giving big speeches, but sometimes it's just about like random timing and, uh, you know, we're along for the ride. Although the random timing, I feel like the 1918 to, and 1920 comparison is um, both on the nose and a little chilling given the 1918 Spanish flu, obviously the last, uh, you know, massive pandemic that our country and the world was dealing with. And here we are. And then the impact of, of all these trends on the census year and the um, tenuous scenario around census and redistricting that we are also living in uh, with the sort of uh, threats of, of, of our census being undermined. Um, and, and whatever consequences that will that will hold. So, you know, it's I I, I really um, I know I said I said this already, but the 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 sort of flowing back and forth between times, time and place. I, I think you just do such a great job of, and it and I I love it because I as I said, like I love history and I love studying history, and I think that there's so much that we can learn from like the the ways that um, people in a different time dealt with the systems that still exist today, or maybe they were changed along the way, you know, but, but I think you make the point in a number of times in the book, like not all that much, you know, they sort of altered and, and we, we changed course a little bit, but, um, you know, but sort of trying to have that context, have that perspective, understand where we've come from, you know, I mean, the, it, within the context of redistricting, I mean, the fact that things that we sort of think are really, really, uh, um, you know, like the one person, one vote <laughs> principle, which is like, you know, younger than, younger than George Clooney, right? <laughs> like that it's, you know, that these things are actually not that old and not that set in stone. I mean, one person, one vote is, should not be altered. That's <laughs> my point. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, but I just, I love the, the, the sort of that historical perspective that you would, you sort of consistently brought through all these issues. Yeah, well, and it, it, I think one way to think about it is an issue like one person, one vote. It, it's, a, it's a reminder of how fragile this sort of thing is that, mm. um, you know, some of the stuff that we, that I grew up assuming is like a bedrock American value, like, no, actually, that's, you know, that got here, right, like two years before the Beatles did. And then the, but then the flip side of that, too, when we think about just talking about redistricting, I, I was totally surprised by this when I was doing the research for the book. That the, that the rules around districts, the uniform nature of every congressional district is, I believe, 1967. And because, yeah. you know, I, I love a good analogy, it also turns out that's when Pringles were invented. So, um, that, so I was surprised by both of those things, frankly. I thought Pringles would have been much newer and I thought redist districts would have been much older, um, but it turns out they're both, uh, you know, pretty modern inventions. Oh my god, I, I absolutely circled that and I was like, man, we should put this on some social media, like just fun facts about redistricting, same age as Pringles, um, or like districts as they exist now. Um, so y'all both mentioned history and I just, um, this number that you quoted, David, uh, 48 million, which is how much red map cost and that it was more expensive to make Mamma Mia the film, which um, 
I hate, frankly. So it like even more stood out to me because I was like, how much would it cost to make that horrible movie? But like the fact that $48 million is all it took to basically, and I'm going to just screw us and like us being people um, out of like access to like healthcare and like climate change that's like sensible solutions to it and like fighting gun violence um that 48 million like it's baffling to me because at the same time uh the 2012 election cost a billion dollars like the campaign spend was a billion dollars and like that's an election and everything shifts every two years if you give or take but like 48 million is all it took but I just want to ask this question and I hope it's like the obvious but are we prepared now are we ready do we know what's like, are we doing the right things is uh, I feel like both, yeah, both of you would be much more qualified than I am to answer this question since you're actually doing the work. Um, so I don't know, how, how are we doing? It <laughs> <laughs> made him nervous, <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> I, love, I love to ask authors these questions. They always like look back at me and they're like, I don't, I don't know, you tell me, or like, are you doing the right thing? But like, part of me is like, yes. I mean, I, I think, Yes, we are, we're doing the right thing, but, like, um, to know, like, to know that it only took 48 million, and, like, 48 million on the, like, flip side, you're like, oh, my God, that's a lot of money, and it, 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 it it's a coin that flips both ways, I guess, is what I'm thinking about. Um, what, one, one thing I will say, because I don't know about, about the details, um, I think that it took 48 million dollars, and also took the rest of us, at least writ large, to not be paying attention. So I think if there's kind of one theme running through the book, it's that, um, you know, as a, as a movement, Democrats and progressives, we've really been focused for a very long time um, on the president in particular, and also on the players on the field, right, in, in the contest of politics. Even if we understand that politics is not a game, it's not a sport, but we tend to focus on the elected officials and who's doing what and who's saying what. And for decades, conservatives, and this is to their credit, have spent a lot more time thinking about the foundations of the system and the rules of the game. And so that while if we had spent $48 million in the same way um, and come up with a comparable program, you know, you kind of end up in this political arms race, which is why campaigns are so expensive. It would have cost a lot more than that to, um, you know, to influence districts for a decade. But in part, it's because we left the field. And, you know, this is true on judges, and it was true for a long time on voting rights, and it's true, uh, it was true on campaign finance for a while. Um, and so I think the good news is the fact that we're doing, the, the fact that we're here virtually, um, the fact that all on the line exists, the fact that you all are doing this work is a sign that that's not the case anymore. And the fact that so many people and volunteers are engaged in it. Um, so I think in that sense, we're, we're in a totally different environment. Uh, you know, I guess here, uh, just to sort of throw the question back to um, the, the practitioners, as opposed to sort of like someone who's kibitzing and writing about it. Um, Marina, I feel like it, the last time we spoke was a couple months ago when, when my book first came out. I'm yeah. curious, in the last few months, how, do you feel like the environment has changed in ways that, uh, do, and do those changes surprise you? What's... David, that is, yeah. a, that is, a, that is a quite a question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I imagine that uh, folks who are tuned in here are also uh, pretty tuned in to what's going on uh, in the country. And that, you know, I laugh and, and um, as we mentioned earlier and Shahen was saying, like, you, you know, obviously this is the work that we do every day. We care uh, incredibly deeply about it. Um, and, uh, you know, I often say like, you laugh to keep from crying. Um, and, you know, I do think you have to bring some humor and levity and, and um, just to stay sane because, uh, you know, it's so interesting. It's such a good, you know, um, uh, such, a, such a good question because I, I've been thinking about it so much. And um, I think in your book, you know, so much about just thinking about the systems that we, you know, that have, have long um, uh, had and at, at various points taken, taken for granted, um, you know, and I think that we are in 
you know, I was rereading the passage um, of your interview with Mark Elias and, um, you know, the, the comment that he makes about how, you know, the, the last thing that the Republicans had was a sense of decency and that now that that's been stripped away, you know, it's, it's just bare knuckle. Um, I mean, the, the attacks on our institutions are bald faced. They are I, I mean, increasingly so, and I would say increasingly over the past two months. I mean, I think the closer we get to election day, the closer, the more we see the willingness of the president and his enablers, I will say, like Mitch McConnell, I mean, brother Mitch, <laughs> like just everybody who is, um, just willing to tear it all down for power. And it's, it really is terrifying because I think, you know, as someone, I, I obviously we spend our, our, our days, also my nights <laughs> when I can't sleep and I'm up thinking about this stuff, you know, thinking about how we come together. And I think your point about people paying attention is so important because it's, you know, I, I think we did see a little bit of like, you know, they started messing with the postal service and people paid attention. Local journalists were like at their postal service taking video of machines being pulled apart. Like people cared and people were speaking up and Postmaster General DeJoy did have to sort of backtrack a little bit. Um, you know, then, and we also have situations where we're a redistricting organization, but um, you know, I also say first and foremost, we're a voting rights organization. And so when, when we're a redistricting organization, but we sort of are in this, this universe where we filed a, a, a lawsuit last week <laughs> against the post office. And, and you know, when, when we're in this scenario where it's, you just, it's because we have to, because if there's, because it's sort of like in order to, to defend any of our systems, we have to defend all of them. Um, and so, uh, you know, as terrible as it is, I do think, you know, things have gotten, um, much more uh, intense over the past couple months. Um, and, you know, all of this exacerbated, you know, Shahan mentioned COVID, all of this exacerbated by the fact that we are still in a pandemic um, with a government who doesn't seem particularly interested in, in providing solutions. So, you know, <laughs> it, it's, um, this year has been, has been a challenge in a number of ways. And, um, but I am, you know, I, I am heartened by, um, the fact that people are that people are engaged and, and paying attention, and so um, I, I have a, a list of folks who I'm going to be sending your book to before November third. So uh, make sure make sure everybody gets off their off their booties. It's funny, Marina, when you started laughing when David asked that question, I was like, oh no, she's going to talk about the census, which is like literally my next question was about the census because <laughs> well, that too, <laughs> mer, mer, like spoiler alert, here's a peek under the hood. Marina's whole team spent the summer thinking about what a census delay would look like and what the impact would then be on redistricting. Um, and suddenly Marina was like, my entire summer, like my entire summer and my team spent like all of these legal interns from like great universities who like spent their summer with us suddenly were like, we worked on these memos and looked at 50 states to figure out what the impact of a census delay would be on redistricting. And now we're like speeding up the timeline that like, Supposedly, I just read San Diego is going to stop counting people um, in 16 days on September 18th. And like, what is what is the impact? And like, you know, um, we you talk so much, David, or not so much, but you like ask the question about like what the citizenship question impact would be, right? And like, we were like, we're on this. Like, we're going to sue the Trump administration, like the National Redistricting Foundation, like Marina, <laughs> they don't file a lawsuit, and we're like no, we're not going to like let this stand. First of all, you're like scaring folks who are undocumented in their family. So you're going to have an undercount there, but also like where you're going to like, when I say you, I mean like the administration is going to use this to say like, okay, well, what, what, like, is it people? Is it citizens? And so now I just feel like the, the whiplash for me is, is all around the census. So I don't know if either of you want to say anything or if Marina, you want to yell at me yeah. for asking this question. No, I mean, the census is obviously so incredibly important and uh, also something that has been really, really frustrating thing to watch over the, over the summer, I mean, over the past couple months um, to see, you know, we, 
I think it was in April when the administration at first said, okay, we need a delay. And at first people were a little concerned, but then, you know, as the pandemic was really taking hold, I think everybody sort of recognized that this was a necessary thing that needed to happen for the census to be done correctly or as close to correctly as possible. Um, and then of course, like, you know, I think once, uh, uh, the president figured out there was a more politically advantageous path for him, which was uh, don't have a good census, don't complete the census, don't count the people that he doesn't think are going to vote for him, uh, then, then it's a complete about face and all of the sort of statements from the scientists and the, you know, uh, the nonpartisan staff at the, at the Census Bureau who are, take their jobs very seriously, um, you know, none of that mattered anymore. And now they're not doing quality control. They're not completing the count. They're not, you know, um, completing non-response follow-up of people. They, there is, and this is sort of what I was saying, David, to your, to your question before is, it's an active, it, it's, a, it's an open and active attempt to undermine our systems. Um, and it's, it's brazen. It, it just, I think that that's the biggest thing that has changed in the past couple months is that it's, it just feels like, and maybe, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm too in, in, in my bubble, um, but it feels like every day it ratchets up. And then we're, and my, simultaneously, it's a game of whack-a-mole. So it's ratcheting up on every issue and, sim and then, you know, the next day there's some terrible, you know, new decision about, um, you know, standards for, for, uh, environmental policies and there's you know it's just this it's it's a it's a it's exhausting because they are literally stripping away every protection we have on every on every issue and there's only you know like you can only just do your best to try and keep up but I've I was explaining to someone recently I feel like this year has just been chasing a moving target um, and and I think that they do that on purpose so I had to say I think I, I think about these things a little bit differently than I did even when the book came out in June. Um, I just, you know, when the book came out in the middle of the summer, and it still includes this, I still mostly feel this way. I talk about how, for example, calling an election stolen is really dangerous because, um, you know, an under, you, you sort of do authoritarians work for them when you undermine our faith in the integrity of elections. And that said, I just wrote something recently for the Atlantic about how, what do we do if Trump essentially steals the election. Um, and I think we actually need to start to think about that. I think the census is a similar question of, and I, this is, the answer is outside my lane, but I think, you know, the question, that's the nice thing about being a writer, the question is not, um, which is, what do we do if there's a census that essentially is a non-census, right? Like, um, you know, what happens if, um, uh, and non-census, by the way, is a fun play on words. Uh, <laughs> but, but what happens if we end up in that situation where it's 2021 or 2022 and we say, this is just patently ridiculous. It's not the typical undercount, it, it's crossed some line. And how do we remedy that? And that may require recognizing that norms that used to exist don't exist anymore and taking action that two years ago or four years ago would have seemed pretty drastic. Um, I will say that when I've talked to political scientists about what's going on right now, the way they put it is that basically what the Trump administration is doing there, it's, it's basically, it's like a boxer sort of testing range with a jab, right? Like they're mm. just, they're trying to see what the limits are and where the boundaries actually are. Um, in part because the election is coming up and in part because that's always the way Trump has operated. He just always wants to know what can I get away with? And he's always testing the waters. And so it's not surprising that they're testing. Um, and I think what we're learning is it's not so simple as everything's fine or everything's falling apart. Um, the Hatch Act, it turns out, is virtually meaningless. Uh, you know, I think we all kind of knew that, but we certainly know it now. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think we've seen the Trump administration flirt with violence against protesters, and they unfortunately may not have learned this yet, but it doesn't seem to be working the way that they would like. They're getting more protesters when they engage in violence rather than fewer, which is a very important distinction between democracies that survive and democracies that don't. So, and I think the census is somewhere in a middle ground right now. I mean, on one hand, you have more people who are paying attention to it. Um, there's not a sort of public willingness to say, oh, whatever happens, happens. Um, but at the same time, we don't know how that story is going to end. So it's another way. And I think, um, you know, uh, Marina, to your, to your point, 
it is really exhausting. I mean, it's exhaust, you know, it's exhausting for those of us who are just like reading and writing about it, let alone for those of us who are on the front lines of it. So um, thank you to the people actually doing the work, but also the, um, you know, the, uh, the goal is really ultimately to, to be so exhausting that we're like, oh, we just can't deal with it. And, but I, and I think so far I have to say America as a country does not seem inclined to do that. I think we've seen tons of people, um, particularly people who didn't think of themselves as political before this or didn't care about these issues before this, saying, oh, no, wait, our democracy is at risk. I should do something about it. I may not know what to do, but I care about it. And I think that's a real distinction that we're seeing compared to other countries where autocrats have um, you know, gotten a lot further than they've gotten here so far. We'll, we'll yeah. see. I think that once it's, I think it's a really great point, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, you know, I am um, uh, Shahen is more it, it, the the sort of political understanding is more of your lane, Shahen. Um, so I'm interested in your thoughts on this as well. But you know, the the idea that um, sort of um, sticking up for our democracy is a partisan issue it seems so frustrating. Um, and such a challenge when you are like genuinely trying to avoid becoming an autocracy and, and trying to, you know, even as imperfect as our systems are, we, we have them and, and we have institutions and we have norms. And I, I totally agree with you that I think we've seen, um, unfortunately, that a lot of those are, uh, as you put it, um, they're like Tinkerbell, right? <laughs> like if, if we stop believing in them, they cease to exist. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 it's, that is the thing that I want to, to, to focus on, but I also find so frustrating because, you know, you sort of say, well, this is a thing that we should all believe. And then you get dismissed as like, oh, well, that's just, you know, the Democrats talking point. It's like, no, no, like that's like our system of government. <laughs> like, you know, um, but Shahan, I'm interested in your thoughts on that too. No, I'm, I, I think about it the same way. Like this is like systems of, and norms of democracy. Like we should all care about that. Like gerrymandering, that's a bipartisan issue because no one party and like the, the idea that like one person one vote doesn't actually mean anything because someone who lives like in an undermander district actually gets more of a say so like that's like we should all want our vote to mean the same thing like David you make the joke that like you should have the same like it's like with the rock right like everything should be equal but then you're like oh wait that's not like that's not actually how it works and so it like it blows my mind that at this point in the election cycle for what it's for what it is um that people aren't seeing like their systems and like the norms that we all believe in sort of be eroded that like there isn't um a question mark about like why why do we actually think that the post office is a bad thing like <laughs> your mail gets delivered i um it like i i'm still understand like i don't understand the polling behind it and i don't understand um like the rationale between like holding and sticking so tightly to to where we are, um, yeah. I wish I wish I had an answer. I I just want to quickly jump in and say that yeah. Gary in the chat a while ago had asked uh, you all to explain what All on the Line does, which I and I yeah. just make sure that we don't get through. You know, poor poor Gary is waiting and wondering who on earth he's listening to. So Gary, <laughs> thank you for sticking with us. Um, but uh, I, I, before we get to that, I just I wanted to just add one thing about this because I think it's important from a messaging standpoint or way of thinking about it, which is, um, you know, I think the post office is a great example because it actually is a democracy issue that a huge number of people care a lot about. Um, you know, the post office is, uh, right, because it's very tangible to people. Um, not necessarily because mail-in ballots um, are that meaningful to people because people aren't, may not be familiar with it, but when your mail isn't showing up or your prescriptions might not get there on time, you start to care about it. Um, and I think one of the ways that it makes sense to think about these things is most of us, and certainly most Americans, have a lot of urgent issues going on. And right now that's more true than it's been for a very long time. And so I think to some extent our task as people who get to sort of be nerds about democracy and political reform is to think is to make those connections and um, 
you know, one of the things that always drives me nuts is people saying, well, you, know, you can't break these norms because it's a norm. Well, you, know, you have to explain why it's, you know, why is it valuable? Why is it practical? Um, you know, when it comes to gerrymandering, for example, right, the, the, the lack of accountability that politicians have, people get that, right? People get the idea they want to be able to fire their representative, you know, who works for them if that representative is not doing a good job. But we do have to do a better job of connecting the dots. And it's always such a challenge because the more you know about something, the less likely you are to re remember why you need to explain why it's important and to explain it to someone who may not be living it every day. But you all are living it every day, which is an excellent segue back to quickly explaining what All on the Line does. Yeah, Marina, do you want to take that or do you want me to, to, to chat about what Either All on the Line is? Why yeah. You want me to, you want me to start? Uh, yeah, you want to start and I'll pick it up from there. So Gary. Okay. Um, so thank you, David. Uh, and thank you, Gary, for the question. Um, I think it's a, it's an excellent point that you make, David, and, and maybe some of the um, uh, discomfort that we have with um, feeling like things that we feel like should be very important to everybody and that maybe we have been taking for granted um, are, are that people don't understand some of the some of the basics, and so all on the line is an organization that um, uh, exists to fight gerrymandering. Um, you know, I think as as an organization, uh, you know, David talks in his book, and we've talked earlier tonight about the the principle of one person, one vote, and sort of um, the idea being that you know um, elected officials should be responsive to the will of the voters, and it seems like a pretty simple principle. Um, but I think, you know, there is a lot, uh, of work that goes into making that happen. And it's, and it's, I think, hard for us to realize, um, that, uh, that principle. And, and I think, um, particularly over the past 10 years after, uh, the 2010 redistricting, um, or I'm sorry, the 2012, re the 2011 and 2012 redistricting, um, after the 2010 red map, uh, campaign, we saw some of the worst gerrymandering in modern history. Um, and so uh, All on the Line is an organization that, that sets out to fight that. Um, and so, uh, Shahen, you can talk a little bit more about specifics, but um, yeah. I obviously am, am Director of Litigation and Policy. So um, through uh, the C3 affiliate of All on the Line, the National Redistricting Foundation, we file a lot of lawsuits, uh, and then um, uh, on the uh, in, through the all online campaign, it's it's a grassroots advocacy work, which Shahen, uh, you can talk a little bit more about. Yeah. So thanks, Marina and Dr. Brenda. I know that you asked the question about like not courts not picking up um, gerrymandering sometimes as a discussion. So we'll try to circle back to that, um, and I'll have Marina talk about the courts and redistricting, because that's definitely her lane, but um, All the Line sort of is in this position where we um, are able to talk to legislators and say like, your the process as it stands in X state isn't working for me. Um, and so what we are fighting for is both in, is within, um, for lack of better words, like inside the Capitol, talking to legislators about what is the right way in which redistricting should happen. How many hearings should you have? And like, what is in a time of COVID, what is a safe hearing? Like, are you equipped to do hearings just like this over Zoom? How do you fight Zoom fatigue? And when you say people are like not interested in joining a Zoom to say like, let me wait for hours to say like, I need my school district that my children, like that my kids go to, to be within um, our legislative boundaries or our congressional boundaries. Um, and so getting people the ability to training them to testify is what we're gonna be focusing on. Um, I mentioned at the top of this call that we're gonna be focusing on the election for the next 62 days and then pivoting to talk about redistricting. What that means is those trainings exactly. Um, and so the advocacy campaign is getting people prepared state by state to have those conversations, be it um, if it's with um, a, an independent commission, like in Colorado, in Michigan, in Arizona, um, to talk to commissioners, or if you live in like a normal, I don't know that's the right word, like a legislative process state to be able to access your legislator and have that conversation, but also think about your community and like the impacts that it could have there. So um, Gary, I, I think you're going to start hearing from us a lot more about like doing, going to trainings um, over Zoom and getting involved that way. Um, so I hope that helps 
explain a little bit about our work. Marina, I don't know if you want to talk about that question um, that came out of Rucho, like why, why we don't have the courts in a way that we do, but like we, we do and we don't. And like, David, I want to just call this out because I, I actually quoted your book in my notes to myself, which is that the easy way to fight gerrymandering was never the only way. And I want to call that out because um, with the day that Rucho v. Common Cause was decided um, was my second week on the job here with All in the Line and the National Redistricting Fund, like NDRC. And I was like, oh God, like what, like, did I just lose my job? And Marina was like, everyone stop, don't panic. <laughs> this wasn't the only pathway, isn't through the federal court. So Marina, can you talk a little bit about like yeah. why courts don't come that like, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's a very good point. And I think um, on both ends of the spectrum, both that, that, that courts are not the only um, uh, solution, that federal court is not the only solution, but also that, that, there, that there are a number of different ways that people can gerrymander beyond just partisan gerrymandering. And so, um, so yes, Rucho was bad. So, so, so the Rucho decision from the US Supreme Court um, was uh, last year, um, and this was after, you know, basically, you know, and in the book, you know, David, you go through the history starting with Baker v. Carr in the 60s. And so, you know, there is just a, um, we have been on a 50 to 60 year course of, of um, federal litigation, and it will continue um, in different ways, in various ways. But starting with the idea of, um, you know, making, you know, this modern day districts that have to be equal in size and equal in population, um, you know, that that was the sort of groundbreaking decision in the 1960s. And then, and then the court has been struggling over decades with how much involvement are they going to to have, how much is the court willing to step into what they call the political thicket um, when these questions that they view as truly political um, come up. And so uh, the, there's been this, this decades long tension, um, I think starting with Baker and, and, um, uh, and it came to a head over a set of partisan gerrymandering cases out of North Carolina and Maryland. And you know, I think all of the advocates thought we had this moment you know, we had um, this, you know, there was a, a Democratic gerrymander in Maryland and a Republican gerrymander in North Carolina. And so the court was going to feel like it wasn't a partisan decision that they could do, you know, sort of just just be be fair and and, and answer the case. You know, the court over, over years um, had sort of struggled with, well, how do we know? How can we measure? And so, you know, um, Nick Stephanopoulos at University of Chicago, now at Harvard, and um, the, uh, and Professor McGee uh, came together, Eric McGee, and they came together and they developed, you know, this efficiency gap and they presented to the court. And so, you know, you have a whole industry of, of people and academics and, and social scientists trying to show the court, um, I think effectively, that there, that there is a way to measure this, that there is a way to know how far is too far. Um, and there are some legal questions important in there as well. Ultimately, um, Justice Kennedy uh, retired, uh, as we know, and um, and he was, I think, the linchpin that people were hoping hoping for. And so, with him leaving the court, uh, leaving the court, he, I think, you know, ultimately, um, now uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, you know, the, the Ruto decision is one of his like, you know, destroying democracy cases that that uh, he'll be well known for one day, um, along with Shelby County and and. Um, Citizens United and all these wonderful decisions that the court has made. But so Rucho said that, that, that partisan gerrymandering is too much for the court to measure. There's no standard, we can't figure it out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I think that, that decision was wrong, um, but that is the decision that they made. Fine. Um, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, um, so, but, but you have state courts and you have state constitutions, right? And so then in North Carolina, and we actually, um, so through the National Redistricting Foundation, um, the year before Rucho was decided, had started to see the writing on the wall. When Gil v. Whitford came down, which was the redistricting, the partisan gerrymandering re redistricting decision that was decided in 2018. So that uh, decision was in June, 2018. 
And that decision was out of Wisconsin. And similarly, like, you know, the, the facts were just so bad. It was so on its face. The gerrymandering was so bad. And, you know, I think a lot of the advocate community thought this is our, this is the moment. And the court kicked that case back on standing grounds. And I think at the time, you know, uh, we started to sort of see the writing on the wall and to Shahen's point, you know, like, you know, you, you, you can't put all your eggs in one basket, right? And so uh, at that point, um, there had been success in Pennsylvania under the Pennsylvania Constitution. And so, you know, we started doing conducting analysis and looking at what other states have constitutional provisions similar to what Pennsylvania had, which is essentially a, a free elections clause or a free and fair elections clause. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and so, um, uh, North Carolina has a similar fair elections clause. And so we filed a, a lawsuit challenging the state legislative districts that was happening at the same time that Rucho was coming up to the Supreme Court. Um, and so ultimately in North Carolina state court, uh, we were successful in state court in striking down the state legislative map. And then in very short succession thereafter, um, the striking down the congressional map. And so N North Carolina has, will be holding elections on um, fair districts for the first time this decade uh, in November. So um, sorry, that was a lot of information about <laughs> redistricting litigation, but uh, hopefully you followed. <laughs> As you can tell, Marina really hates talking about this. <laughs> so <laughs> do, ahead, you mind if I, do you mind if I just try to wrap up a whole lot of questions really quickly since we're... We yeah, absolutely. Um, and one thing I will just say that I think is important to take away from um, from what Marina is saying, and you know, this is um, I I'm married to a lawyer, so I I'm like, okay, this is the lawyer part where I only understand half of it, but I feel like I did okay. So I um, I Jackie will be proud. Yeah, I, th I think she, <laughs> I think that uh, you know um, I think she would be proud to know that I understand half of what she says. Um, but uh, to me, it's important to recognize that when we talk about gerrymandering. America is not either gerrymandered or not gerrymandered. This stuff happens on a spectrum. So the fact that the courts basically said, I mean, there's an old Sopranos episode, like an early Sopranos episode where one of the gangsters says to a guy like, I'll make you a deal. I'll toss you off this bridge. And if you fly, I won't shoot you down, right? And that's sort of the Roberts Court view of freedom, right? Like we'll throw you off the bridge. And then if you can fly, you're free, right? You do what you want. Um, and that's more or less what happened in this case. But if because of Pennsylvania and North Carolina and all the other things that we're talking about, America is on track to be less gerrymandered in the next decade than it was in this decade. That's not as good as being totally fair, but it's much better than being even more unfair. So th these things are just, you know, uh, as President Obama likes to say, better is good. And I think that's important to remember in a situation like this as well. Um, and that uh, someone asked about independent redistricting commissions. Uh, my own view is that independent redistricting commissions are good, but I would like to see North Carolina and Maryland, as an example, hold hands and do them together. Um, I wouldn't want to see blue states unilaterally disarm and set up independent redistricting commissions and then, you know, basically cede an advantage in the national election for who controls Congress to Republicans because they don't care about fair districts. So I think the way to do it, in my mind, would be to say, if you're Virginia and Georgia or Maryland and North Carolina, how do you how do you do it together so that it's not giving either party an unfair disadvantage? Um, I don't know, frankly, if that's all in the lines position, but that's that's how I think about it. Um, the, I, instead of elegantly tying all these questions together, I'm just trying to answer them really quickly. That's uh, great. No. And let's see. Um, the uh, Clay, you asked about the Skywalker window, which is basically like how do we make change in a very short period of time? Um, I'm going to end with that, actually, uh, and just really quickly vote by mail. And this is not my lane as much, so I don't know if you all have thoughts about it. But to me, the, the issue with vote by mail, um, there's a few different things and they all need to come together. So the, one of the most important things we can do when it comes to protecting vote by mail is just to encourage people to vote early, because the way to attack a vote by mail election is to delay as many ballots as possible and then try not to count those ballots. So if more people vote early, it means that those ballots have to get counted because they will arrive before election day. And it also means that it takes the pressure off the, the postal service on the, leading up to election day. So it, it, where I think it's an important um, 
broader issue is administering elections, managing elections ends up being about whether or not our democracy functions. It's not just about, is this convenient? Um, you know, is there a delay because it's annoying when their mail doesn't get there on time? But it, it, these issues of convenience become fundamental issues about whether we're able to exercise our rights. So that's an important one. And then of course, all of the different lawsuits and all of that um, are, is, is that an all on the line? I'm gonna stop for a second. Is that an all on the line, um, like uh, area? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marina, go ahead. Why don't you take Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I promise I won't be as, um, I won't talk as much. Um, so uh, the, yes, we, we are, uh, we have um, four vote by mail lawsuits that we filed um, in April and May um, as uh, we started sort of seeing what was happening in the primaries um, and understanding the impact that um, uh, COVID was going to have on our elections. You know, I think, uh, uh, um, AG Holder, you know, is, has been very vocal about this, you know, that, that um, Americans should not have to choose between their health and the right to vote. Um, and we feel very strongly about that. So again, as a redistricting organization um, that very much views our sort of um, mission as making sure that the will of the voter is realized, that, that similarly, you know, all of these sort of structural issues are, are um, things that we care deeply about that we are very much engaged in. So, um, uh, as I mentioned before, we, we last weekend or last week, yeah, last Friday, we filed um, a USPS lawsuit. We've got a, a lawsuit we haven't even talked about the president's uh, uh, attempt to, to mess with apportionment. So we've got a lawsuit um, challenging uh, the president's attempt to remove um, uh, undocumented residents from uh, apportionment. And um, we've got four, uh, although three active, because we um, settled and had success in Minnesota. So um, we now um, are, are fighting that fight along with many other uh, awesome organizations. You know, it's, it's, it's an all hands on deck um, in the advocacy community <laughs> effort, obviously. Um, but but uh, yes, to all of the above. And, and I think, you know, um, so, so both making sure that people have the right to vote by mail making sure that those ballots once uh, submitted, uh, make it to the post and make it to uh, the elections office. Once they are received to the elections office, uh, making sure that they are counted. Um, and so, and sort of all of those steps in between. So there's a variety of, of um, legal action uh, that we're involved with that, that folks and different organizations are involved with um, to make sure all, at all of those steps. And I think one of the results that, that I always want to remind folks, um, one of the results of this is that we will not have results on election night and that's okay. And um, the president's gonna try and use that to his advantage to say that there is, that that means that there's fraud or that because, you know, the people who vote on, you know, in person that only their votes should count or sort of whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so I think, you know, especially as Shahen was talking about us sort of pivoting our, our efforts um, and looking at the election, those are going to be some of the issues that we're going to be paying close attention to. Yeah, Maureen, if I can only add one thing, I think it's that like, if you're voting by mail, you do it early, you drop those ballots off um, in the mail or directly to your elections office. But then if you can, and if you feel comfortable and safe doing it, and I want to emphasize if folks feel comfortable and safe that they sign up to serve as a poll worker. Um, and like, there are organizations that are really actively recruiting poll workers in communities and that's where we need to actually see some support so again if folks feel safe and comfortable absolutely encourage that um david i'm going to let you answer the skywalker window question and i'm going to wrap us up here yes i'll, I'll be really quick about this no, of course. So, um you know there's this question of what do we do if they we're talking about all of these different ways that things could go wrong but what do we do if things go right if democrats have an opportunity to actually pass laws, which may also require ending the Senate filibuster. I like, we mostly talked about the House where the Senate is like a much bigger problem. So that's exciting. Um, the, the short answer I would say is, I think we, we often think about this a little bit incorrectly in terms of what do we do first and what do we do second and what do we do third. Uh, my view is the way that change happens right now is you only get these little windows in order to make a big difference. And so the thing we should do is try to do as much of it as we can, as quickly as we can, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to fixing the foundation of our country. Some of it will stick, some of it won't. But the way that this stuff works is that every anti-democratic action, every restriction on voting rights, makes it easier to restrict voting rights in the future. 
The reverse is true as well. So the more problems you solve, the more you make our democracy real or more real for more people, the easier it becomes to solve the rest of the problem. So I would say, um, you know, the, the big picture answer is sit down, do, try to do all of it at once, right? Like this is not a time to, to sort of think about it overly cautiously or carefully and see what you can do, see what you see, see what sticks. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have that opportunity. And thank you everybody for, uh, for being here and for um, watching and listening. Absolutely. And David, thank you. So I just want to plug a few things. So um, as we pivot to the election, because that's where we're headed, um, I really encourage folks to go to mobilize.us backslash NDRC. Um, what we have done is the National Democratic Redistricting Committee has endorsed um, about 212, actually not about, 212 candidates who we believe are a fair maps candidates. Those are candidates who really are fighting um, to make sure that when they cast their vote in the legislature um, in 2021 or 20, sorry, yeah, 2021 or 2022, they are doing it for fair maps. Um, you can text bank, phone bank for these candidates. You can find out if there's one that lives near you or if you really care about and you want to adopt a state, that's the best way to do it. Um, I also want to make a thank yous to everyone. So David, thank you so much. Thank you for making me laugh. Like I genuinely mean that. Like I'm really excited about your cat being the first president um, that's a female, but isn't the first orange president. Like I giggled so hard, it was really embarrassing. Um, and like, I just thank you for making me laugh while talking about our crumbling democracy that is fixable. Um, Marina, I wanna thank you for coming off of vacation to talk to David and I um, and all of our participants because I know how important vacation is, especially when you get like one to two in a crazy, crazy year. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for Jonathan for running tech today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Jin in North Carolina, yes, we will send you these websites. Um, and then I really wanna thank our participants who have joined us over the last year to talk about voting rights, fighting voter suppression, and then waging the battle for fair maps. So thank you all, thank you for joining us. Um, and we will talk to you on Twitter and text and phone soon. So thank you all, have a great night and stay safe out there. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.